Uh, first of all, I would uh, like to introduce myself. My name is Asr Awad. Uh, I'm with the, um, uh, the committee of the SCT Plus. So starting with the SCT itself. So the SCT itself is, uh, is our main society, which is, uh, stands for a Society of Underwater Technology. Uh, and it's a multidisciplinary learned society. Uh, so we bring together organizations and individuals with an interest in underwater technology, ocean, ocean science, and offshore engineering with global outreach. Uh, the SCT Plus is uh, mainly uh, for young professionals. So uh, it's created for developing professionals, graduates, and students by developing professionals working in the industry uh, of the subsea. The SCT itself was founded in uh, 1966 uh, and has members from uh, more than 40 countries around the world. Including engineers, scientists, and students working in every in all of these areas. If you're first time to hear about us, or if you're more interested uh, in knowing more about us or joining uh, our future events, uh, just follow us uh, on our uh, LinkedIn or check our website, uh, YouTube channel, or send us an email. I'll uh, I'll let David now uh, introduce himself. Okay, thank you, Asher. Uh, so good afternoon and uh, thank you very much to everyone uh, who's attending today. Uh, my name is David Simon. I'm a, a subsea umbilical engineer working for Subsea 7 in Aberdeen. Um, and I've been a, an umbilical engineer um, since around uh, 2004 in various guises. So I'm here today to uh, present to you a, a general overview of uh, subsea umbilicals. Uh, but in particular from a, a more engineering perspective. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much to SUT Plus for inviting me along today. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to talk with you all. And uh, thanks specifically to uh, Andrew and to uh, Sruthi for uh, setting this up and uh, sending out the invitations. So thank you guys. So let's uh, jump right in. Uh, so <clears throat> Let's start with the big picture. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, a, a typical uh, subsea development. Uh, we've got our, our topside facilities, in this case an FPSO, that's housing our uh, accommodation um, and all the equipment that we required to, uh, to control our subsea facilities. Uh, the subsea facilities themselves um, are going to be our, our wellheads um, tied back to uh, manifolds, uh, maybe some subsea production equipment, and then everything is uh, tied back uh, through various flow lines and control umbilicals uh, back to the topside facilities. So in order to operate a field like this, um, we need a, a constant transfer of both energy and um, of fluids between the topside facilities and the subsea infrastructure. So in simplistic terms, that's uh, what this looks like. Um, from topside down to subsea, we've, uh, we've got our communication signals. So that's uh, our instructions to command the subsea equipment to perform the operations we require. Uh, we may need to send electrical power subsea, either to power the control system, or if we've got any uh, electrical equipment down there, such as subsea pumps. Um, we need to uh, send hydraulic power to subsea. Most uh, current subsea systems are based around uh, hydraulic systems, and we need to provide that high pressure hydraulic fluid from topside. We also need to supply chemicals, which we uh, inject in uh, various areas subsea um, to perform functions in terms of uh, the likes of uh, wax inhibition um, or for corrosion control or fluids that will be injected into the well stream. And we look to re-inject our produced water after it's been processed. Uh, and also we have uh, gas lift operations that we need to take care of on some occasions. And then coming back to us from the subsea infrastructure, we've got um, our produced hy hydrocarbons, obviously. Uh, we've got our communication signals. So our, our confirmations that the, um, the actions that we wanted to be performed have been performed. And then we've got data coming back to us um, from all the, the uh, subsea sensors that we've got. So 
the, uh, the hydrocarbons that come back and the water reinjection and gas lift, they tend to be serviced by dedicated pipelines. So if we remove those from the list, uh, what we're left with is the, the functions that we typically need to take care of um, via our subsea umbilical. So what do we need in order to satisfy those functional requirements? For our communication signals, we can send those either electrically um, or optically through uh, low voltage cables or uh, fiber optic cables. For our electrical power, uh, depending on the power requir requirements we've got subsea, uh, we can send those as uh, low voltage or uh, medium voltage. Um, in terms of the hydraulic power, we've got a choice to send that through either thermoplastic hoses or through uh, steel tubes. I'll uh, talk in a little minute about um, the difference between those. And similarly for the, the chemicals that we're going to inject, we need to decide if we're going to go through hoses or tubes. And finally, the data that we get back, um, we can either have that provided through, again, low voltage cables as electrical signals, uh, although ideally we'd want those through fiber optic cables um, due to the, the uh, significantly increased bandwidth that we have available. So just a quick word on um, tubes versus hoses for our hydraulics and for our chemicals. Um, really the, the choice between these is made on a project by project basis uh, based on the specific needs of the development and the kind of areas we need, need to consider within that decision process. Um, and I've, I've presented this as a pros and cons for each type. So for tubes, um, we have significantly higher collapse resistance um, due to the, the nature of it being a steel tube. Um, we're unlikely to get uh, any permeation of fluids through the tubes. Uh, the tubes themselves can act as tensile strength members within the umbilical, um, which can mean we can do away with the external armor wires and they provide excellent chemical resistance. However, there are some drawbacks. They're relatively difficult to handle. Um, the tubes themselves and the final umbilical have relatively large minimum bend radii. Um, so there's a limit to how much we can manipulate and handle these umbilicals. They are susceptible to fatigue failure. So in high, highly dynamic environments, um, we have the potential for fatigue failure of the tubes. Typically, they're more expensive, not always, but most of the time. And um, <clears throat> often they can uh, lead to long project times as uh, there are a limited number of suppliers of tubes and depending how busy the industry is, we, uh, we might have to wait a while for our delivery. On the thermoplastic hoses side, um, the pros list is uh, lower cost typically. Uh, good availability, they, they're usually um, manufactured by the umbilical manufacturers in-house, so um, they're readily available and they're much easier to handle with uh, smaller uh, bend radii. On the con side, they do have lower collapse resistance. So when we get to deeper waters, we might uh, run into some problems there. And we can have permeation of fluids, particularly methanol, which um, with the uh, small molecular size of methanol, it can actually permeate through the polymer matrix of the, the hose um, and causes problems as it migrates along the hose. <coughs> uh, we do have limited chemical resistance. Some chemicals are fine, other chemicals will degrade either the polymer um, or the, uh, the strength braid and uh, can reduce the performance of the hose and potentially lead to failure. And we do have a, an expansion of hoses under pressure. So there's an addi additional volume of fluid um, as we're pressuring, pressurizing hoses that we need to account for within our control system design. So the decision, as I say, is a case by case basis. Um, once we've decided on the, the functionality, um, basically what we do is um, gather all those components together. We twist them into uh, a bundle. Uh, we then bind that bundle together. Typically we'll extrude a, a molten a polymer jacket over the top of that. That provides um, bonding for the components and, and also um, provides an armor bed for the uh, subsequent layers of armor to be applied over the top. And then finally, we finish with an outer jacket, typically in polyurethane or, or polyethylene um, and um, for outside protection of, of the umbilical. And that's uh, essentially all an umbilical is. Um, 
to cover the, the kind of types we've got shown here on the top left is a, a typical electrohydraulic umbilical where we've got a selection of, of uh, hoses uh, to the right hand side, some low voltage cables for signals. To the left of that, some um, looks like medium voltage cables um, for power supply. And then through the center, we've got some steel tubes and some fiber optics. So whatever functionality we require, uh, we design a cross section that accounts for that. And then we bundle all our components together. On the right hand side, um, this is a more uh, power focused umbilical uh, for electrical power. So we've got two three phase AC power supply circuits in there. That's the, uh, the central um, triad and the outer triad made uh, from the, the copper power cores. And that's typically to run something like a, a subsea pump, which requires a much higher uh, power requirement. And in the, the lower picture I've just shown, um, what an umbilical typically looks like uh, from a, a bigger picture perspective, um, the umbilical manufacturer will manufacture to either a, a carousel as shown here or uh, an installation reel. And that's ready for uh, transfer over to an installation vessel to take it out the field and actually uh, deploy in situ. Excuse me. So <clears throat> this is just an uh, overview of how umbilicals actually fit into the, uh, the bigger picture. On the top left, uh, the gray area is our topside facility. Now that could be either a platform, an FPSO, or even a shore-based facility. And that's where all our um, hydraulic power supplies, our uh, chemical pumps, and our uh, electrical generation occurs. Uh, and all those functions are passed down uh, through a series of junction boxes uh, into our first umbilical in the series. And this is uh, known as our riser umbilical. This transfers everything we need from the top side down to the seabed. Um, for a dynamic vessel such as an FPSO, this umbilical is a, is a dynamic umbilical. Um, and as its name suggests, this umbilical will be subject to dynamic motions throughout its, its entire operating life. So we've got a lot of engineering to do there to, to verify that that umbilical will survive those motions. Uh, the remaining umbilicals that can be seen in the system here are all seabed static. And they distribute uh, the, the various uh, functional components out to the, the elements of the subsea architecture, the trees, manifolds, valves, and connect everything back to topside so that we can both control and supply to and from all these components uh, from our topside facility. So that really defines what an umbilical is and uh, the function it performs within a, a subsea field. So we'll now do a little bit of a discussion about the, uh, the main suppliers um, of umbilicals around the world. So in my view, there are um, really five uh, main umbilical suppliers, um, which are shown here. Uh, these um, uh, all have multiple manufacturing facilities around the world to service um, local markets. Um, I will caveat this at this point by saying that this list is um, likely to change very soon. Um, I've uh, recently become aware of some developments in the industry and uh, there may be some, some changes upcoming to this list. Uh, I don't have anything definite at the moment, so um, I will uh, leave that as unsaid at the moment. But uh, yeah, be aware that this, uh, this may change. Uh, so take it with a, a pinch of salt for now. Um, and then below that, we've got a number of uh, what I would call smaller scale umbilical suppliers. They typically specialize in certain types of umbilical products, but they uh, tend not to have the same market share or the same capabilities as the, the top five. So I won't go into details of each, um, but this is a, a useful resource um, if you ever do get involved in a, an umbilical project and uh, require to, to survey the market. So now we get into the uh, the engineering part, um, which is, is obviously uh, my, my own specialist area. So umbilical design, um, I've described this as an en engineering smorgasbord. And what I mean by that is, 
Um, you can see in the list here, I've, I've given an overview of the types of engineering that we would have to do um, in order to, to fully design and verify an umbilical. And um, for us engineering graduates uh, amongst the audience, you, you will recognize that um, these topics touch on just about every subject that uh, one would have learned as part of a, a bachelor's degree. Um, so it, uh, I'm not going to go into them in detail, but it was really just to make the point that um, uh, umbilical engineering uh, involves a lot of aspects. Um, if you like, it's a, a feast of engineering, or, or one could, uh, we could, could almost describe it as a, as a party. And uh, as we all know, um, all engineers uh, know how to party. So looking at the umbilical design in, uh, in a little bit more detail, uh, this is a typical electrohydraulic thermoplastic type umbilical. I'm just going to break this down into the, the main sections. So we've got the sub bundle, which is the, uh, the first bundle of cabled elements. And the number of elements within this is, is pretty much defined by the capabilities of the cabling machine and how many bobbins it has available um, to, uh, to feed components in. That sub bundle is, is taped uh, and sometimes extruded. And then over the top of that, we will apply um, subsequent layers of components until we've reached the required uh, level of functionality that we need for our, our development. Once we're happy with the components, um, we then go on to uh, an extrusion, um, which is typically a polyethylene or polyurethane uh, material that's extruded over the top of the bundles. That's to hold everything in place and to uh, provide a bed for the, uh, the armor layers, which are subsequently applied. These are typically high strength uh, galvanized steel wires. They're applied in a, a contrahelical manner between layers. And they're primarily there to provide the tensile capability for the umbilical, but also mechanical protection for the components we pull. And then finally, an outer jack is extruded, either in PU or PE. Um, although some umbilical manufacturers still use a, a bitumen coated um, ropes uh, as a final jacket. But either way, it provides the same function. Now, just to contrast that with a, a typical steel tube design, um, the principle is the same, but what you'll notice is that we're missing uh, armor wires on the, the final layers of the umbilical. And that's because the, the steel tubes themselves, uh, while performing their primary function as uh, fluid conduits, can also be used as the tensile strength member of the umbilical. Um, and so in those circumstances, we can do away with the armor wires. Now that may or may not be beneficial to the system. It all depends on, on the, the bigger picture and what we need from the umbilical. Armor wire um, adds more cost obviously, but then it can add more weight, which can be beneficial to us in terms of its uh, dynamic responses. So really it's a case by case basis as to what, uh, what type of design suits uh, a given scenario. So I'm just gonna to touch a little bit on um, umbilical manufacturing. And uh, I can already see that my uh, presentation is misbehaving. Uh, my apologies for that. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. No. Uh, give me a little second. I've got an alternative prepared. There we go. Okay, so this is actually um, a simulation of uh, JDR's manufacturing plant, which is uh, down in Hartlepool. And this shows the method by which the umbilical components are cabled together. So the components sit on these large bobbins at the back of the machine. And then as the machine turns, the components are fed through and uh, gathered together at the closing die at the front of the machine here. The small bobbins at the front, they contain um, either the smaller uh, elements of the umbilical or uh, fillers to take up all the spaces uh, in between the functional components. The, uh, the machine itself is, is uh, known as a planetary cabler. The, the, the planetary aspect comes from the motion of the bobbins, which as you can see, stay uh, horizontal as the machine rotates. And that's to 
minimize uh, twist building up within the components as the uh, as the umbilical is manufactured. And then the output is uh, gathered onto either a process reel or a process carousel, where it then goes on to further manufacturing operations. So excuse me for a second, I'll just have to switch back to my uh, presentation, which I can grab now. Uh, Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, so, when it comes to the design of the umbilical, <coughs> what is it we actually need to determine? And this is where the engineering work comes in. So we need to understand the physical properties of, of the umbilical itself. The, uh, the weight, uh, both with fluids uh, inside it and with it empty, um, and its weight uh, submerged and uh, um, out of the water as well. Um, obviously, its diameter, and we need to understand its stiffness properties, uh, both axially uh, in bending and in torsion. We need to determine the, the limiting capacities of the umbilical, so how much tensile load can we put through it, how much crush load, um, how much can we bend it, and how much impact can it take. We need to understand how it performs under fatigue loading, uh, which component within the bundle is likely to fail. Uh, we need to understand if it's torsionally balanced. And we have to take account of thermal considerations as well. That could be heat generated within the umbilical from say power cores, or it could be heat that's generated from an adjacent pipeline if we've installed um, in a similar route to, to a flow line. Uh, and we also have to, to uh, understand its uh, flooding uh, capabilities. Uh, it may not be readily obvious, but within the umbilical, all the spaces around the functional components are actually flooded with seawater by, in, by design um, via small holes in the, the outer jackets. And um, that means that we minimize uh, buoyancy um, and we avoid any instability with the umbilical uh, and also to keep it pressure balanced. So why do we need to understand all these topics? Um, it's because we are going to go and install our umbilical in um, a very harsh environment. Um, this is North Sea, but obviously uh, equally harsh in, in other parts of the world. And we've got a number of environmental conditions that we have to deal with. We've got wind uh, resulting in waves, we've got uh, significant uh, currents, and uh, we've got resultant motions of the, the floating uh, production facility. And our umbilical must be designed to withstand all these forces without damage, and uh, it has to operate for the specified design life, which can be anywhere up to 25 or 30 years. So a lot of engineering is required in order to verify the operability of our umbilical for the, the full design life. So the first area we're going to focus on is the um, the dynamic catenary or or the section of umbilical um, that runs from the the topside facility down to the seabed. Um, in simplistic terms, we could look at a free hanging catenary, which is where we simply suspend the umbilical. And in a relatively benign condition, this might work for us. However, as soon as we start to get any vessel motions topside, those motions are going to be translated directly down through the umbilical. And we're going to see a lot of damage occurring at the touchdown point. And we're going to see overbending, uh, fatigue, and wear. And that umbilical is likely to fail very quickly. So what we need to do is find a way to, to effectively decouple the topside vessel motions from the touchdown point of the umbilical. And we do that by installing in an S-curve configuration, as shown here. There are a, a, a variety of types of curve, uh, but they all perform the same uh, principle which is the free hanging suspended portion of the umbilical here is used to absorb all of the vessel motions um, because it's free hanging and suspended it uh, is unable to, to clash with anything. It simply moves around as required. Uh, and then once we get to the, uh, the touchdown point, all of those uh, vessel motions have been removed from the system. And we get very little movement in the touchdown point. In the steep S and lazy S, these are both built around uh, what's called a midwater arch, which is a structure installed subsea, which the umbilicals are draped across. 
um, and that uh, that arch is either tethered to the umbilical or tethered uh, to the seabed. Um, the steep S, it's tethered to the umbilical and we get tension in this lower portion. And the lazy S, it's just draped over and uh, we, we don't get that tension in the bottom section. But in either case, the, the principle is the same. Uh, another type of configuration we might look at is the, uh, the steep wave and lazy wave. Effectively, it's the same principle, but um, instead of using a midwater arch, in this case, we use distributed buoyancy modules, which are attached to the umbilical over a specific length. And that gives us the, the same end result, which is a uh, S-shaped catenary, um, and hence the, uh, the same dynamic compliance. So once we've designed our catenary, we then have to, to look at um, what potential failure modes are we going to get within this uh, umbilical. And there's a few key areas we need to focus in on, the, particularly where the flexible umbilical meets the uh, inflexible topside structure. Um, if it's outside of the, the water, if it's above the water line, then we've got potential um, thermal effects from sunshine as well as UV exposure. And then below the water line, uh, we've got an area of, of significant um, dynamic movement and therefore potential for fatigue and, and uh, high strain failure. Uh, moving down through the catenary, we need to take account of shock loading, of clashing with other elements. Uh, we've got fatigue at the, the sag bend. Um, the buoyancy modules can insulate our umbilical, so potentially we've got thermal issues there. And then at the touchdown point, we again have dynamic issues. We've got friction, we've got temperature, and we've got abrasion with the seabed. And then any section of the umbilical that's on the seabed, we have to account for any uh, geotechnical obstacles that might be in our way. So we've got a lot to analyze. Thankfully, we uh, have some lovely software that uh, can do a lot of this work for us. Uh, this particular one is a screenshot from OrcaFlex. Uh, there are other softwares available. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is we build a 3D model, including our umbilical. Uh, we include the, the topside vessel, and obviously we are constructing this um, uh, under the, uh, the, uh, the surface of the ocean. And we input our various parameters um, to build the model. So we input wave and current data, which is taken from the, the Met Ocean data available for, for any given field. We input the, uh, the vessel motions or RAOs. Uh, RAOs are response amplitude operators. And they tell us how the vessel will behave dynamically under certain sea, um, sea state conditions. We will input the umbilical properties that we uh, determined uh, earlier, and also the buoyancy properties. We can then um, hit the start button effectively and run a simulation that allows us to uh, simulate how the entire system behaves under any, any given um, set of, of uh, wave and current conditions. So we can model uh, storms, we can model extreme events, uh, and then we can check the behavior of the umbilical to make sure that we haven't um, exceeded any of the, uh, the the limiting factors of our design. The outputs uh, tipped from that analysis are typically tension angle plots um, that we can then use to determine the fatigue damage within the umbilical. We can check for clashing with uh, other components of the system. We can look at compression loads at the touchdown point. And we can analyze for uh, vortex and induced vibration, excuse me, VIV. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a couple of slides time. So obviously, an umbilical is typically not installed in isolation. It's installed as part of a much larger uh, subsea system. So once we've completed the analysis of our individual umbilical, we then need to move on and insert that into the global model and perform analysis that allows us to see how our umbilical performs uh, with respect to everything else that's in the system. I'm just going to run a little simulation that sh hopefully uh, shows you uh, an OrcaFlex uh, model actually running. So we've got our vessel topside, which is um, obviously reacting to, uh, to the waves that uh, have been simulated as passing. And below the vessel, we've built our entire global system. So that includes uh, our umbilicals, risers, flow lines, and our buoyancy, which in this case is midwater arches. 
And what we're really doing is, is um, checking how all of these components behave um, together as a group um, and whether we have got any potential clashing uh, between elements. Typically, we aim for similar densities, so similar weight to diameter ratios between each of these, these um, components of the system, and uh, that determines the, the dynamic behavior of them. We also have to count for things like marine growth um, and reduction in buoyancy performance over time, which uh, can also affect the model. So this allows us to, to build a complete model um, and allows us to, to verify that our umbilical uh, will both survive um, uh, its, its own dynamic uh, motions and also that it will uh, play nicely with everything else that's been installed alongside it. And from that analysis, we typically find that one of the key areas we need to look at is the, uh, the transition from the umbilical to the topside structure. As I say, this is a, a damage hotspot um, where we typically get quite high uh, bending loads and, and high fatigue damage. So um, how do we manage that? We uh, use something called a dynamic DSR. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these. Um, if you look around you at the moment at pretty much any cable that might be on your desk in front of you, uh, where the cable meets the end connector, you'll see a small tapered uh, section. Uh, that is effectively a BSR. And it's the same technology we use for umbilicals, only we uh, engineer them to a much uh, higher degree of uh, accuracy. So what a BSR does is um, when we apply a tension in the umbilical at a given angle, the BSR um, forms a, a nice smooth curve uh, due to the, the tapered geometry of the, the construction. And um, it prevents us from approaching the, the minimum bend radius of the umbilical and also minimizes the fatigue damage from any given bending event. And the way we design a BSR is um, on the bottom left, we have the predicted tension and angle plots, which is a result of our, uh, our dynamic analysis. So this is everything that the umbilical is likely to go through during the operational lifespan. And then on the right, uh, we design a BSR such that the capacity curve stays uh, to the right of these tension angle plots. And that means that for any event that occurs um, during the design life, we know that the BSR will be able to, to manage uh, those loads. Now, I did say we were going to talk about vortex-induced vibration. So this is a, an experiment um, just to really convey an understanding of what the VIV is. The, the setup here is a, a steel cylinder, which is suspended in a, a channel. And through that channel is a, a, a relatively slow um, current moving through the water. Um, and that's, that's moving alongside or around the, the steel cylinder. As that water moves past, we have a phenomenon called vortex shedding, whereby um, the current causes vortices to be shed in a sinusoidal manner uh, from one side of the cylinder to the other side. And that happens in a, a regular frequency. Now, if that uh, frequency of vortex shedding happens to coincide with the natural frequency of, in this case, a pendulum, but in our case, it would be an umbilical, then we can get some pretty significant lateral movements or vibrations. And we're just going to have a look at what that looks like. So the, uh, a dye has been injected uh, just to show what's happening with the fluid as it passes the cylinder. This is relatively slow um, current, and uh, as you can see, there's kind of random uh, distribution of, of uh, the vortices. And in this case, we're not seeing a lot of movement in the cylinder. However, if we increase the flow, you'll notice that we've now reached a point where vortices are being shed in a regular pattern. And we're seeing this um, significant excitation of the, the cylinder from side to side. And this is the vibration that we're talking about in VIV. And this is what we're trying to avoid. Obviously, in an umbilical situation, if we have this vibration occurring over a long period of time, um, much like a, an airplane wing um, as it's flying, then we are 
uh, in danger of inducing a fatigue failure in one or more of the components of an, in our umbilical. So how do we mitigate uh, VIV? Well, first of all, we have to analyze um, and understand if, if uh, VIV is going to be a problem for us. It can occur uh, either in the dynamic section of the umbilical or it can occur uh, on the seabed where we have uh, spans. In a dynamic catenary, if we do have VIV and um, we have some DMV guidelines which we use to, to uh, determine if VIV is going to occur, we can either modify the umbilical properties to change the, the natural frequency. Um, in other words, we can add weight, uh, which will change the dynamic response. However, that will have effects elsewhere that, that may be uh, not favorable for us. Another approach is to add what we call VIV strakes. These are uh, plastic uh, fins, if you like, which are attached to the outside of the umbilical and they form a, a helical pattern um, as they move down the umbilical length. These fins, uh, due to the geometry, the helical geometry, they disrupt the, uh, v, the vortex shedding um, and they, they prevent this uh, regular um, frequency of, of shedding from occurring and therefore they, they dampen down the, uh, the VIV effects and they're very effective at suppressing uh, vibration. And uh, on the seabed spans, um, again, we could have currents moving past the umbilical here, we could have VIV being induced. Um, and if we do encounter that, um, then typically we'd look at either preparing the seabed better before installation to avoid these spans, or if we do come across spans, we can use uh, either grout bags or sandbags uh, to support the umbilical, or we can go in and do some uh, rock dumping to, uh, to again, prevent that uh, span or, or shorten the span to the point where VIV will not be an issue anymore. Another piece of analysis we need to look at is uh, st seabed stability. Uh, as the umbilical sits on the seabed, it um, has a number of uh, forces acting uh, around the perimeter. Um, caused by currents and caused by wave action from topside. And we have to be able to analyze these forces and determine if, given the soil conditions, our umbilical is going to sit where it's supposed to, or it's going to wander off in, uh, in any, various, any direction uh, as a result of those currents. So we've got some DMV guidelines, again, that we can use to analyze that. If we do find that we've got some instability, if the umbilical is not heavy enough, we can either make it heavier, uh, potentially by adding uh, further armor wires um, or components within the umbilical to add weight, or we can look to uh, perform trenching, rock dumping, or, or mattressing of the umbilical to uh, to stabilize it and uh, prevent it from uh, from moving off uh, in a lateral direction. Uh, testing of umbilicals, um, there's a lot. Um, I'm just going to briefly show you the amount of testing that is required of an umbilical um, as we go through the, the uh, international standards for umbilicals, which is API 17E or ISO 13628-5. These two standards are very similar, um, but uh, in recent years have actually um, gone from being perfectly aligned to somewhat departed. So one of the key questions for any umbilical project is which standard do you wish to follow? Um, the, the testing of the umbilicals, uh, the, sorry, the umbilical components throughout design and manufacture is, is fully defined within these, uh, these documents. I'm not gonna go through those in detail because there's far too many, um, but what I will cover is some of the umbilical testing, um, perhaps the more interesting testing that we might get into uh, as part of a, an umbilical project. So the first one is, uh, squeeze or crush testing. Uh, when we install the umbilical, we're gonna run it through an installation tensioner. This allows us to hold back the weight of the umbilical as we install. And we need to understand if, if the squeeze loads that we're gonna apply are going to in any way damage the components within the umbilical. So we uh, perform a test to effectively simulate that and confirm no damage occurs. Flex fatigue testing. We use that to simulate the umbilical hangoff um, at the likes of an FPSO. Uh, this rig here uh, actually belongs to Oceaneering 
And uh, this is a full scale rig where we have a, a full dynamic BSR plus a section of umbilical installed in this rig. And then the yellow portion at the front rotates and uh, flexes the umbilical back and forth. These tests can run for um, significant periods of time up to, to six months in some cases. And um, typically with fatigue, because it's uh, such a, a notoriously difficult thing to predict, uh, with umbilicals, we um, we utilize a, a 10 times safety factor within our umbilical designs. So that's that's to say that within the 25 or 30 year operating period, we're only allowed to use up 10% of the uh, predicted uh, fatigue failure point. When stiffness testing, we use that to uh, verify that the predicted figures we came up with earlier um, are, are born out in reality. If we find we've got a different stiffness to what we predicted, we might have to go back and revisit our analysis um, to input the new data and, and see what impact that has. And then a tensile torsion test. Uh, this is, is to simulate the end terminations of the umbilical um, and to also verify the tensile capability of the umbilical itself. Um, so we apply a tension um, from one end, we allow the other end to freely rotate and we measure any rotation that occurs. And that's also a characterization of the umbilical to understand um, how much rotation we're likely to encounter um, as the umbilical has been installed or been operated. So I think I've got uh, a few minutes left. Um, apologize if I'm running over a little bit. I'm gonna jump on to um, a little bit about the future of umbilicals. Um, I think the, the, the sort of first port of call is, is to um, appreciate that uh, at this point, we've now um, really depleted and, and used all of the, uh, the oil reserves, which are within a relatively easy reach. So there has been uh, shallow water developments. There are still a few available, but now we're having to look at uh, much, uh, much deeper water. Um, and we're looking in terms of uh, the, the, the both deep water, which is greater than a thousand feet and ultra deep water, which is greater than 5,000 feet, as well as uh, long tieback. So we're really bran branching out to uh, tap into these reserves, which are until now uh, unexplored uh, due to the technical challenges. So our umbilicals are gonna need to um, really improve in design in order to meet these challenges. Uh, we'll see some significantly increased tensions through the umbilical as a result of the deeper water. Um, and therefore we'll, we'll need to uh, do a lot of work in optimizing umbilical design, um, particularly in providing uh, the, the sort of uh, payoff between weight and tensile strength, uh, which may require us to, to actually uh, utilize some more exotic materials within the umbilical, such as uh, carbon fiber. We've got increased uh, hydrostatic collapse as a result, so we might have to beef up our, our umbilical tubes to deal with that. Um, and installation becomes extremely challenging under these situations. We've got a lot of tension and uh, we have to squeeze the umbilicals significantly to, to prevent a, a runaway. So um, some really high high challenges there um, that the, uh, the latest round of umbilical designs are, are uh, certainly striving to meet. Um, something we're seeing a lot more of is integrated service umbilicals. So this is a, a traditional umbilical, but with the addition of a large bore central tube. Um, the central tube is uh, multi-purpose really. It can be used for bulk delivery of chemicals or, or uh, be used for gas lift, or even in some cases be used as a, a flow line. Um, the challenges associated with this is, is processing of these large bore central tubes. Umbilicals by their nature are flexible and large bore tubes by their nature are not. So it's a real challenge to get these processed um, through an umbilical factory and, and managed as an umbilical and obviously protecting the components around them um, to make sure they're not damaged by this, this uh, large tube under bending. Um, so a lot of manufacturing challenges and uh, typically these are, are associated with uh, long uh, short tiebacks, uh, which we're seeing a lot more of, uh, especially in the Norwegian sector at the moment. And the final point I wanted to, to uh, touch on is the uh, general 
drive towards uh, subsea electrification. Traditionally, our subsea developments have been hydraulically controlled and the umbilical has been the conduit for that uh, hydraulic supply from topside. We're now at a point where technology is at the, um, is at the level that we can look to um, electrify a lot of those subsea functions and thereby from an uh, umbilical perspective we can move from uh, less hydraulic to more electric functionality. So the umbilical design um, will be simplified in terms of not having to, to provide hydraulic uh, supply lines but then uh, counter to that we'll have increased uh, power transmission demand so the, the power cores uh, will increase in size and obviously we'll have the, the other effects associated with that, such as uh, thermal issues um, and uh, potential uh, crosstalk with other cables. Um, and it really, it's uh, going to change the nature of umbilicals um, and the, the umbilical suppliers uh, obviously are in a situation where they need to adapt to this and, and make sure that they uh, keep ahead with these changes. Taking that a step further, um, is the uh, what we're calling the DCFO solution, which is a DC uh, direct current slash uh, fiber optic. And this is a combined um, uh, DC power and fiber optic cable solution. The, uh, the utilization of DC power as opposed to the more traditional AC allows much longer tiebacks. Uh, so ideally this would be to a, a shore-based facility. The uh, the power cable, the DC power, is combined with uh, fiber optics in a single cable, which is uh, very compact and much easier to install. Um, and it provides all the, the power and communications requirements uh, in order to both communicate with and control the, the subsea system. Of course, chemical injection is uh, likely to still be required. Um, that can be provided either through a, a dedicated uh, chemical line uh, accompanying the uh, the DCFO cable, or um, something that's been investigated at the moment is is to have subsea local chemical storage, which is um, located adjacent to the the, uh, the the subsea infrastructure, and is uh, regularly topped up by supply vessel rather than having a, a dedicated shore supply. So what does that all mean for umbilicals? Well, where we have a, a traditional electrohydraulic umbilical. The, the changes as we move along really depend on the level of adoption of uh, DCFO technology. Um, as a first step, um, what we could potentially do is, is uh, remove all the electrical and fiber optic um, uh, facilities within the umbilical and replace that with a single DCFO cable, which can either be cabled into the umbilical or can be routed alongside. But this still retains the sort of hydraulic functionality of a, a subsea system. So it's, it's really just a, a slight modification to existing systems. However, taking a next step from that, if we were to go to an all electric field, then we can get rid of these hydraulic services altogether. And all we need to supply is chemicals and all our power and communication is uh, transmitted through this single cable. And then taking that one step further, um, I discussed the, the local chemical storage subsea. Um, if we can uh, implement that technology, then really the only tieback we need to our topside or shore facility is the single um, uh, DCFO cable. And uh, just to, to give a, a sort of uh, overview of what that cable looks like um, or the, the, the key technology of it. So the, the, the central core is a fiber optic, um, which is, a fairly standard design, um, which is a, a number of fibers contained within a steel tube, and that runs through the center of the cable. But the re real sort of key technology here is a, a tubular conductor, a copper conductor, through which the fiber optic cables run. So that allows you had to have uh, this, this concentric cable design, um, which is uh, significantly easier to manufacture than an umbilical and therefore significantly more cost effective. Uh, these cable designs are already in existence and already been used to subsea in other industries. Uh, so it's, a, it's not a new technology as such. Um, it's just the uh, adoption of uh, this technology into the oil and gas industry. Um, and as we all know, the, uh, the oil and gas industry is uh, 
certainly a, a slow wheel to turn and uh, it will take a while for these changes to take effect. In the meantime, there will still be a, a part to play for traditional umbilicals uh, for some time to come, but this just gives a, a feel for the, the direction that uh, we're generally heading at the moment. 